Okay, we are just arriving at our spot. And take a look. The tide is pretty high. And if you see here in the chart, high tide was at noon. And we're getting here around 2.15 p.m. today. So the tide is still pretty up here. Uh, low tide today will be around 6.40 at night. Hey there, anglers. Lisa here with the IGFA. I am also here with my fellow anglers. We have Joanna and we have Nick joining us today. And we are here at Bill Keith Preserve Park in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We're going to show you that you can still find decent fishing spots and green spaces in an urban environment. So yes, you can still go fishing even if you live closer to a city. So stay tuned. We're going to catch uh, some live bait today, use some lures, mix it up and see what we can catch. There are tons of way of throwing a cast net. This is the way that I like to use. So here's my cast net soaking already in the water. I'm gonna take my handle, I'm gonna pinch a little line off, push it through the handle. That's gonna go on my left hand because I'm gonna throw the net with my right hand. But with this little loop, it'll stay on when I toss. I need to do arm length loops and wrap them into my left hand. I'm gonna do this until I get to the very top of the net. Right here, this is called the horn. So I'm gonna grab the horn right there. Now the way that I throw my net is my weights that are at the bottom, they're gonna go right by my feet and where my hip is, I'm gonna grab the net. Where I grab the net, that's also gonna go in my hand. Make sure you have this loop. Don't grab it like that, it won't open. Now, I'm gonna pinch out half of my weights. Once I have that pinch, I'm going to temporarily roll it over my thumb. So again, just temporarily roll it over my thumb. So now I have high weights and I have low weights. What I need to do is grab right in the middle and I'm either going to put this over my shoulder or I'm actually going to bite the rope in between the weights. You do not bite the weights. Okay, you can definitely bite the rope and you're good to go. Not the weights. Once I bite the line, I'm going to grab a little lower and then roll the net back over. So, grab my line. Grab the line down here. Roll my line over. I'm gonna go back and launch. I'm gonna let the weight sink a little bit and then I'm gonna retrieve. Hopefully I caught some bait. Not this time. So as Joanna said, there's many different ways that you can throw a cast net. Um, this one's slightly larger than the one she threw, but um, I'm right-handed, so I tied the rope onto my left hand there with a loop, and I made nice even coils there, which I'm holding in my left hand. I like to grab the net a little bit more than halfway, make a big loop, put that in my left hand there. So from there, um, like she said, you don't have to put this in your mouth, but if you do, you grab the, the rope here, not the net or the weight, and I put a little piece in my mouth, and then I grab about a third of the net with my right hand. So you pull out about a third of the net, and then you spot some bait, so make sure you have polarized sunglasses so you can see in the water. And once you see some bait, pull back, do a little spin, and then let it sink to the bottom. I like to give it one big pull at first, and then you reel it in and see if you caught any bait. And look at that, I got a few mullet in there, so perfect. So once you have your bait here, you want to get onto land and to a dry spot. You can pull the horn and that will open up the net. And then you can shake your bait out here. So we got three finger mullet here. And you want to put them in a bucket with water and make sure you have an aerator running so that they have the oxygen necessary to stay alive. And then you 
ready to go fishing. Quick tip before we start rigging our bait. When you throw the cast net, you want to try to get it as much of a circle as possible. You don't want the cast net to bunch up. You want it in a perfect circle, which will increase your chances of catching some live bait fish. So since I'm gonna be using the live bait that Nick caught, I'm gonna have my setup with an egg weight, a swivel, a leader, and a two-aught circle hook. So this one's gonna help me catch a, hopefully a larger fish. So first thing I need to do, I need to check my egg weight, see if it has a larger opening versus smaller opening, because I need the smaller opening to be closer to the swivel. And once again, I'm going to tie a uni knot, because that's one of my favorite knots. So I'm gonna take my line, pinch it. My tag in is gonna create a loop. I'm gonna pinch that as well. And now I need to tie my loop and my tag in bottom. I'm gonna twist those two together. I'm gonna do that about six times. Once I've done that, I'm gonna pull slightly, then all the way. And now I need to attach my leader. My leader is 30 pound test, while my fishing line is 20 pound test. So my leader is gonna be a little more stronger if I get a fish that has teeth. Tie that uni knot one more time, pull tight. And then lastly, I'm gonna tie my hook on. Go through the eye of the hook, pinch my lines, make my loop, twist my tag end over the two lines, hold tight, and always remember you need to cut the tag ends off. I'm gonna get my pliers out, cut the tag end close to the hook. Make sure I don't lose that line. I don't want to litter. One more. Now let's go get my bait. All right, so here we have our live finger mullet. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna hook this guy once from the bottom of the jaw to coming out of the top of the head so when I go through the bottom of the jaw, I'm gonna do a slight wiggle, wiggle, wiggle to get the hook to come out the top. So that way the exit is gonna be as small as possible. Now finger mullet, they're pretty hardy baits. So even though I did just hurt this guy by the hook, he's gonna last a while while he's out in the water. And if by chance, you know, he, uh, he becomes a dead mullet, they are great as cut bait as well. So when you're choosing an artificial lure, sometimes you want to match the hatch, as some would say, or use a lure that looks like what you're catching in the water. So we just caught these finger mullet. So some of these representations are meant to look like finger mullet in the water. So this one you can see looks somewhat similar. Um, this one actually skimmers across the top of the surface, the hook eyes in the front, versus this one's on top and it dives down a little bit deeper. Um, this is another one, you can see the patterns and look is almost exactly the same, it's just slightly smaller. And we're seeing mullet not only this size, but a little smaller in the water, so this is something that could work. Um, you're not going to use a bait fish this size if you're seeing mostly bigger bait in the water, you want to use something similar to what you're seeing. Um, another couple options would be lures like this. So this is meant to imitate a glass minnow, same, like, same with this. These are typically found uh, more mid-water, and that's why you have these diving lips so that you can actually um, get them down to the proper depth. And uh, these are not fish that we'd catch in our cast net, but we know they're out there, so these would also be good presentations to use about right now. So for this lure, I'm using the two treble hooks that it came with, um, but another option to replace is with inline hooks. Um, if you're doing this, you wanna make sure the middle hook is facing down and the back hook is facing up. So that's another option if you'd like to replace the trebles with single hooks. 
All right, so we're gonna tie this little glass minnow lure on with a non-slip loop knot. Start by making a little loop here. Pull it tight to about the size you want the loop. Go through the eye. Go up the side that's facing up. And then pull it down to the eye. Loop it around three times. And you wanna go, make sure you go down the downward facing knot then, once you pull it closed. So through there, pull it tight, and you have your knot, just like that. And I like to use non-slip loop knobs when I'm using lures so that it gives them a little more flexibility and a little more natural motion in the water. So with the tide going outward for the next couple hours, um, the water is going to be pouring out of this canal into the main river. With that being said, a lot of the fish will likely leave the canal, travel the middle of it out this way to the main river. So the goal is to get the bait out in the middle somewhere uh, where the fish will be making their way out to the main river. Okay, so Joanna is going to make her cast right there. Right where Nick said. All right, we'll see. We'll see what she gets. Live bait and artificials in the water. Fish on. Okay, so how we have Nick and Joanna set up fishing, waiting for them to catch a few fish. Let's talk about the park here. We are at Bill Keith Preserve Park in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and this was dedicated to a man who was part of the development team for Fort Lauderdale. However, you can see right here with the sign that he loved the waterways. He loved the green spaces. So he understood that we needed a balance between growth and development and preserving our aquatic habitats, our wildlife, so that anglers like us, recreational anglers, we can come out here and we can enjoy the day fishing. So while Joanna goes fishing, I actually brought our hydrometer again so that we can check out to see if this is salt water, fresh water, or that brackish water. So I'm just going to put it down. Fill it up. And then we're going to see where this nozzle moves, okay? See where it moves with the amount of salt in here. But first we have to go put it on an even surface to get an accurate reading. Take a look. With our hydrometer, the salinity is almost completely zero, just a little bit above zero. Now, we are in the south fork of the New River, and eventually this does connect to other rivers that lead to the ocean. So there should be some salt in here. This does link to some salt water. However, here in Florida, we just had a huge tropical storm come through a few days ago, Tropical Storm Ada. Now, Ada dumped a lot of rainwater on us, which all of that water runs off into nearby canals. The canals kind of lead to these rivers and these rivers lead to the ocean or to the Everglades. So that's why we're seeing a little bit more fresh water in this location. So that's kind of interesting. I wonder if it's going to affect what fish, what type of fish that we catch today. <laughs> So here we have a ladyfish. First fish is a ladyfish. They look like a little baby tarpon, um, but they're actually really good live bait or cut bait for snook and tarpon. So maybe we'll keep this guy and use him for bait. Sounds good. All right, first fish. Ooh, we got another one. Looks like a baby Jack Craval. So the one thing with the treble hooks here, it's a little harder to get the hook out sometimes, but he was hooked perfectly. We'll let him swim off. Depending on how old you are, 
depends on if you actually need a fishing license. So if you're over 16 or under 65, you actually need a fishing license to fish and of course to keep fish if they're legal catches. So me, I actually have one of the really fancy dancy ones that not only for freshwater, salt water, but I also have my snook permit and I have a lobster permit as well. Today, we are fishing for, you know, ladyfish, jacks. I'm actually trying to go for a snook. I have live mullet on my hook and a snook would love to eat a live mullet. It's their candy. They absolutely love eating mullet. So I need to make sure that if I caught a snook and let's say it was a, a fish that I wanted to take home and eat, that I need to follow the regulations to determine if it's a fish I could keep. Snook are a very protected species in Florida. Not only do they have a slot limit, they have to fit within a certain size for you to keep, they have a bag limit, they have a season of when you're allowed to keep them, and then of course you actually need a snook permit. So on the east coast, a snook has to be more than 28 inches or less than 32 inches. If it's any smaller than 28 or any bigger than 32, it has to be let go. Even if it's 32 and a half inches, that's too big. It's gotta go back in the water. It's always, always important to bring your fishing regulations to make sure you know what you're allowed to keep, when you're allowed to keep them. But if you're just fishing for fun, catch and then you release, you're good to go. So if you catch a fish and you're planning to release it, you always want to wet your hands first before handling it. And you want to reduce the amount of time it spends out of the water. So only lift it out of the water for a few seconds at a time and remove the hooks. best to keep them in the water as long as possible. Okay anglers, how about we go take a hike? Let's go look and see what Bill Keith Preserve Park has to offer. I saw some hiking trails on the way in here, so we're going to let uh, Joanna and Nick fish some more and we'll go see, we'll go explore and see what we can find. Let's go! We are going to take a bucket when we go traveling because like I said before, uh, we just had a tropical storm come through. So a lot of the water kind of rushed up here, rushing in a lot of uh, a lot of pollution. So how about we just grab a bucket on our walk and we'll pick up along the way. Let's be good stewards to the environment as we go fishing. You can always leave your fishing spot cleaner than when you came here and found it. Every little bit, goes a long way. Look at this. We have a gumbo limbo tree. A gumbo limbo tree is nicknamed the tourist tree because you can see the bark is red and flaky. So when tourists come down to Florida to visit, they sometimes forget their sunscreen and get really burnt. And then eventually they turn all red and flaky, like the gumbo limbo tree. So when you go fishing, make sure you put on your sunscreen. As you go explore, don't forget to look up. You see that box? That's a bat box. A lot of parks and natural areas do have walkways that you can get your exercise. So if the fishing is slow, go take a hike. See what you can find. Go explore. You never know what wildlife is going to show up. Do you see it? Do you see him? Green heron. We're not the only ones fishing today. Here's another fishing spot. 
So it looks like Bill Keith Preserve has all sorts of little fishing spots. So it's perfect for an individual angler or a small group of anglers like a family to come fish. As we mentioned before, it's getting to be low tide. So the tide is actually receding, which means it's going down. So with this mangrove trunk right here, you can see where the tide was earlier today at high tide, right where the dark and the light meet on this trunk, right here. That's how high the water level was earlier today. But as you can see, it's a lot lower and it will continue to get lower and maybe this will be completely dry at low tide. Hey, look who I found. That looks like Nick. Okay, you can see Nick. Nick kind of switched up spots here. Must be the fishing kind of slowed down where he was, trying a different spot here at Bill Keith Preserve Park. See if we can't catch another fish. But even though the park is close to Interstate 95, which is a major highway, it is surprisingly pretty quiet. I want to talk about one more good tree that we have here in Florida. The sea grape tree. You can tell it's the sea grape tree by its round leaves, okay, kind of looking like a plate. And also, eventually, they have stalks like this. Okay, it's not seasoned now, but these will be filled with grapes, okay, little purple grapes. However, this tree is federally protected, and there's a few reasons why. It has very good roots that kind of hold the soil in place to prevent erosion. Okay, so as cities develop with lots of big buildings, um, sky rises, roads, we start losing a lot of our trees. So on our beaches, uh, we start getting a lot of erosion and the sand erodes away, especially when big storms like that tropical storm came through, when all the water rushes up and then eventually recedes, it takes a lot of that soil with it. So trees like sea grapes and mangrove trees, the, root, the roots help keep the soil in place. And also the roots, as they're in the water, it provides good habitat for little baby fish. Woohoo! I think Miss Lisa's gonna fish now, finally. We took a hike, got some exercise, and I'm going to use this uh, feather jig right here. Let's see what we can catch. All right, so as you can see, with us fishing, Joanna and myself are way beyond six feet. Each fishing rod, you know, about six feet, six and a half, seven feet, or even longer. We'll take a look. Even when we reach, we, get, we can barely touch our rod. So definitely six feet away from the next angler. Make sure we all stay safe out there. Even without the six feet of safety, it's also good to give yourself some space out as well because you don't want to cross lines, you don't want to tangle. We're not going to be very much good friends if we tangle with each other. If you do wade in the water, make sure you actually have closed toe shoes because you never know if there's something like a sharp rock or maybe a loose hook or even sometimes glass in the water. You're not supposed to bring glass in this park, but there are people that don't follow the rules and there is some broken glass behind us. So definitely make sure you guys stay safe. Well, thank you for joining us at Bill Keith Preserve Park. The low tide is upon us, so the fishing has slowed down a little bit. We are going to continue fishing and enjoy this beautiful sunset that we're going to have. But thanks again for joining us as we are fishing Florida. We learned the difference between natural baits, artificial baits, and also how to catch our own natural bait by throwing the cast net. Thank <laughs> you.